most awesome people um, who really just give me the green light to do crazy things. So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the crazy things that, that I've done in my newest crazy project. And, um, and then I want to give you guys some practical advice about how you and everything can go back to your schools and actually start some of the crazy projects. Okay, here we go. Um, so, on Twitter, um, you can find me as at PCS Tech. Um, I always tell teachers this when I go to present conferences that if you are not plugged into Twitter, um, you are really missing out on 24 7 always on PD. Um, it, is, it is your personal learning network, it's just out there ready for you to tap into it. Yes, you're going to drown in a flood of like, what in the world are they talking about initially. And once you kind of learn the language, um, it's an amazing place. So I'm giving away my secrets of where I learned all the different things that I, I can share with my teachers in the district. Um, it's through Twitter, um, and through the people that I connect to, all these brilliant people. Okay, so I want to talk to you a little bit about what Saga is about. So Story and Game Academy um, kind of got started with this idea that, okay, we've done World of Warcraft as a project in the school district. We've done Minecraft. Um, as a project in the school district. What's left? What can, um, what can we do? Where can we go that has not been really explored yet? Because my goal is, when it comes to game-based learning for classroom teachers is to start breaking down barriers. I want people to be able to um, have examples they can point back to uh, and say, see this crazy guy down in South, uh, in South East North Carolina, he's doing it, and here's how. And so one of the things that we, we do with I do with all the projects that I work in is I try to share um, ad nauseum all the stuff that we're seeing and, and the way that we're doing things so that you can go back to your administrators or, or your network folks or whatever and say, this is how they're doing it. I think we can do this too. So let me tell you what Saga is all about. Saga is about exploring the learning potential in good video games. Um, we um, talk a lot about the things that we want to see in students. Businesses are talking about the things that they want to see in students. And what's awesome is that I keep hearing, as I was watching people present yesterday and today, I'm hearing the same things that I'm going to be talking about in my presentation. That's good because our message is getting consistent. And that's a really good thing. So a lot of the things that employers say that they're looking for in, in their workforce that's coming in, um, the, yeah, the, the three R's, the traditional sorts of things are important, what they really want are skills that we're not doing such a great job of teaching in the traditional classroom. But video games are doing a really good job of this. And that's things like critical thinking and problem solving. Um, some of today's video games are incredibly complex. Um, there, there are all these huge mental uh, hurdles and cognitive processes to go on as you begin to explore and uh, solve these puzzles. And, and it, it trains you, it conditions you, it gives you things um, that can use skills that transfer to the real world. Um, communication and teamwork, our multiplayer games like Guild Wars 2, World of Warcraft, Minecraft, all these great games that, that we're talking about, that you're hearing about in this conference, um, they all foster this environment of communication and teamwork. They have to because it's a multiplayer game. Creativity and innovation, this is something that employees are looking for. And games are giving us the ability to do these things very relatively cheap and, um, and really without a lot of limits. So students can really explore and push the limits of what's possible in games like Minecraft. So the, these things are all there in video games. And what we want to do in Saga is, is say, OK, bring me a game. Let's take a look at this. Let's, let's have students explore these games and find out which of these games do certain things well and what things can be improved. You know, Jim G probably heard a lot about him in this conference. Um, you really need to read G. Um, he talks a lot about the value that's in the video games and, and what's there. And he really talks about this idea of pleasant frustration. Or really, students and, and players of all ages, really, of being in a game. And, and games push us to our limit of, of optimal performance. And that's the cool thing about games, is if they're too easy, we're not going to play them. If they're too hard, we're not going to so the best games are designed to keep you right in that spot that's really challenging. It's hard to do really in your regime of confidence. 
Um, and that's something that's truly important um, because I think a lot of times in, in the classroom, I did this, and when I say these things, it's because I did these things when I taught high school science for seven years, is I teach to the middle. And, and the students who, who get it, fine. The students who didn't get it, I'll remediate and work with them after school. And the students who um, are accelerate, they're bored. And, and, and I, in creating this little, all these kinds of enrichment and things like that for them to keep them challenged is very difficult. And I know that's difficult. Uh, but video games do that really well. Uh, and they're designed to do that really well because they, they adjust to the player. And so G talks a lot about that in his books. And I'll share the subtitles with you in a moment. Um, also, there's a slide missing here, but just so you know, all the resources and things that I'm sharing here are going to be on my website. I'll share that with you, that link in a moment. Um, so they're all there. If you want to take that time, we've got the links and everything are there on the website. She talks about all the different learning principles that are, are in games that make them important and make them good for learning. Um, there's a really good white paper that he's written that you can just Google Tim G learning good games and it'll come up and it's free to download. And he talks about all these different principles. Things about uh, just in time learning, um, that the, the game gives students a sense of agency, um, cross functional teaming, et cetera, et cetera. All these things are part of the game. And these are the kinds of skills that students can take in the workforce, it's a novel situation, and really uh, apply them, and, and that's the kinds of things that business is looking for. The other thing that we want to do with Saga is encourage thoughtful media consumption. Um, one of the things that's emerging that's concerning me about our, our, our game play, our younger game players especially, is that they're playing games, but they're not, they're not really thinking about the learning that's going on, and, the, and that they are learning. And there's a real disconnect there. So I, I recently um, talked a little bit on my website about this idea of calling the wall because I'm starting to see this. And it, it's very easy to see in the adult world. In our rat race society where you know, we get up in the morning and we, we rush to work, we rush home, we've got all these things and deadlines and all that. Um, but we tend to think of work as one thing and play as another. And, and we keep those two things very separate. But interestingly enough, this was mentioned in, in uh, earlier talks, but the opposite of work um, is not play, it's depression. And, and that's so true that, that we, we built this wall between work and play, but sometimes the most optimal work situation happens when we're approaching it very playfully, with a playful spirit. Um, this is a perfect example of a quote, um, where you, you look at what goes on in the classroom, and, and the minds of teachers and the minds of that there is this wall between play and learning, and we've really lost that. Um, it used to be that we incorporated play, I think, more in our instruction, in our instructional time, and, and we do that less now. And that's really a tragedy because we're really losing um, sight of something that's a really powerful uh, learning experience. And if you really think about it, for example, the scientific method is very similar to a game. The way we approach science, we say, um, I have a theory about how something's going to work. I kind of verbalize that or something, I test it, I see how it works, whether I was right or wrong, and I come back and I just adjust and retry. Um, that's exactly how games work. I think I can beat the boss at the end of the level by doing X, Y, or Z. I go and test it, it didn't work, I adjust my strategy, and I go and try again. And we need to be able to transfer those things and make that connection and break, reach that wall. The scariest thing about this to me, though, is not so much that adults have this wall, between this idea of play and work or play and learning, our kids have this, this wall. And I'm finding this out because I, I posted last year a video on YouTube of my students playing Minecraft. Um, I have about, uh, I work at a school where um, we have about 15 or so fifth graders who've been playing Minecraft. And when we give them a really simple, um, because of time constraints, a really simple design, just want you to build something epic, be anything you want. I want you to build something epic. Whatever you can imagine, you build it. And, and then near the end of the project, um, I went around and I interviewed the students who kind of walked around the classroom and kind of videotaped the things that were on their screen. And I asked them to explain to me, explain to me what you built, why did you do that, how that worked. It's because I just wanted to hear some of the things they said about what they were doing. And then I uploaded it to YouTube. I have to talk to the parents first. They said, but here's what I'm seeing. This is a disturbing trend. So you can go into YouTube now, and YouTube has all these crazy analytics and data about videos and all this content. 
it's there. And if you upload a video, you can go and see who your target, who your audience is, where they're coming from, and things like that. And when I look at the YouTube video, the majority of people commenting on this video, which is almost up to 1.2 million views now, which is crazy, um, that the majority of viewers are 10 to 13 years old. That's the biggest demographic. Mostly males, mostly 10 to 13 years old. Most of them, I believe, I suspect, don't have proof of this. I suspect they're out there, they're trying to figure out how to play Minecraft <coughs> in school. <laughs> so in other words, they're looking for half a round to And that's how they're getting to my video. So imagine they're surprised when they're trying to find a half round. And here's a teacher who's using Minecraft in school on purpose and encouraging the students to do that. And, and, and they're going nuts. And they're commenting. And, and half the comments I have to delete, and that's a whole digital citizenship discussion <laughs> earlier. Thank goodness I moderated them. Um, but a lot of videos have comments like this one. Where kids say things like, you shouldn't have fun during school. School's about learning. Um, the school needs to show them that life gets harder every single day of their lives. How depressing is that? And so this user X, X, gamer or something or another, I'm going to like, okay, I'm going I'm to cyberstalk this kid a little bit. Or cyberstalk this individual and see. And sure enough, he uploaded a couple videos. And one of them, you can tell the kid's probably about 10, 11 years old. Um, and, and this, and I'm like, this is sad. What a sad state of affairs where there's such a divide between what students do outside of school and what they enjoy and what happens inside the classroom and what they think that's all about. And why is that? And what can we do to break that wall down? So that's part of what Saga is about, to say, to teach students, hey, look, you can learn even while you're playing games that you're enjoying, and you can have fun while you're learning. It's okay to do that. If those two things happen at the same time, you know, that's, that's good. So we need to really bring back things like curiosity and play and exploration, experimentation, and, and creativity. Like Sean, I'm all about creation of things. I want my students to make things, make things that matter. And we need to give them opportunities to do that. And video games are really a good opportunity to do these kinds of things. Saga is also about encouraging a critical media consumption. So one of the things that we want students to do, we're, we're getting um, a lot of different games in, into the program. And I want students to play these games for a period of time. And I want them to be able to write a critical review, just like professionals in journalism write reviews about games. And I want them to look at what makes the game good, what, how's the storyline, is it a good storyline? too difficult, too hard, and things like that. So we'll spend part of that time in the course looking at game reviews online and kind of analyzing this and see what they, what they look like, what the structure is, and um, how they feel about those, whether they're you know, valid reviews or, or not. And then we're going to have students writing and publishing their own game reviews online. And, and so we want them, I, I always want my students to interact with the outside world. We can't keep them involved in, in, in the four walls of the classroom. There's too much out there that they need to connect to. So that's another thing we're going to be doing is writing game reviews. Um, so yeah, like I said, student game reviews will be written, we'll publish those online and, and kind of publicize those to the world. The other part of Saga, um, and one of the really exciting parts of the event club, I think games are really good storytellers. And they're interesting in the sense that you become part of that storyline, and that's really powerful. Um, yes, I love good novels, I love good movies, but games that bring a certain level of interactivity, which is really interesting to me. And I think our students like that too. If you don't believe me, just talk to your students, ask them. Tell them what your favorite video game story is and why. And, and notice the depth at which they can explain things like the plot and character and things like that. Um, ask them, what, compare that to Romeo and Juliet or whatever it is you read, like, what, what do you like about that one? And see if there is an equal amount of with the material. So a couple of games, just as examples of games that we're going to be exploring in this, um, we're going to be looking at Journey, which is a really artistic, very interesting game um, on the PlayStation 3. Um, we'll be looking at games like Bastion, um, which is a really interesting game as well that uh, has a really cool way that they do narration in this game and how it responds to the player. Um, games like Guild Wars 2 will be bringing that story element, but also multiplayer aspect. Um, the other thing that we're going to be doing in Saga is building stories. So in addition to looking at stories, analyzing stories, I want students to be able to tell their own stories. Because I, again, I'm really about creating, and I, I like it when our students create things and tell their own stories. And a lot of video games are also, in addition to being fun to play and have value there, they're also good for creating. 
Um, perfect example, and you've heard a lot about it here, um, Portal 2, the perpetual training uh, testing initiative. That is so cool. I had my first experience in, in, in the class the other day. I mean, I've got my account, I've written a role, but that was the first time I actually sat down and played with it, and I could spend hours and hours just making levels and stuff. It's so cool. Um, so the perpetual testing initiative in Portal. But you know, think about this. You, you go and create a level, but in addition to that, how does it write the story about that? Like, how does this fit into the bigger mythos that is around, that, that surrounds um, Portal 2? Like, well, how does this tie into the story? And, and really have them think and be creative about that. And write that down, publish it online when you share your, um, your map. Um, StarCraft 2 has an editor featuring it, the Galaxy editor. And it is really powerful and complex. But we, we're going to make this available to students if they want to really go deep with modding and leveling and writing scripts and stories, they can do that here. Little Big Planet 2 is a perfect example of a game that has really good level editing features in it, and they can tell their own stories um, using this world. So that's one of the things that we want to do. Um, I was absolutely blown away by the Machinima theater that we saw yesterday. Wasn't that incredible? I mean, it's so cool. And, and Machinima has always fascinated me. What a great way to tell stories, you know, by creating videos, but performing it live, like, yeah, wow, that's incredible. So those are the kinds of things where, where you think about the level of thinking that goes on in students' minds. When we say, okay, take the story and, and present it in Halo, um, in Halo Reach. You know, okay, well, you know, they use an arrow. Well, what are we gonna do? They have to think about the material to make the connection within the limitations of the game, and that's a really powerful thing too. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that we'll be doing with the storytelling aspects inside. So is also about breaking barriers because um, you know a lot of times when I go out and present about World, uh, World of Warcraft in school or Minecraft in school, sometimes money is an issue. Um, sometimes technical things are issues. And, and what we want to say is, look, you can bring it in, bring in whatever you have, um, and enlist your students to bring things and see if they'll bring their own game systems in and, and spend some time exploring the stories that are in these games and doing these kinds of activities. Um, and we're looking at exploring these on any platform. So in Saga, we're actually going to be using the Xbox, the PlayStation 3, um, the iPad, PCs, and Macs, um, really just anything. Because not all schools have access to all these different things, but a lot of schools have access to something. And if you want to get started with game-based learning, find that something. And this is, a, this is just an example to say, hey, it's possible. Just think about the possibilities. Another component of Saga is the outreach and professional development. So the really cool part about this is sometimes, if you have to work with the right people, sometimes innovation um, spurs innovation, which is really cool. So um, I was able to get a grant for this program, and I went to our building director and I said, hey, um, we're gonna, I've got this money and this is kind of what I'm thinking about doing, and I've already talked to the principal at the middle school, we're gonna do this, and he said, yeah, you can just take this room here and do it there. I thought, that's great. What I really want to do is change that room. That room needs to be different. It needs to look like, not like school. So I talked to our building guy, and he said, yeah, what, well, what are you thinking? I said, well, I need some furniture. I want everything on the wheels. Um, all of our tables need to be on wheels. All chairs need to be on wheels. Because this is not going to be a static environment. Um, you know, we may use rows if we need to use rows. We will use groups if we need to use groups. We'll have a fishbowl or a semicircle um, arrangement or whatever. And so I said, you know, I need, I need, I'm going to be looking for some funding for furniture. What do you recommend? And he's like, I think yeah, I can take care of that. And I'm like, yes. How cool is that? So it's one of those things where sometimes if you will bring in that enthusiasm and other people have the opportunity to get on board, even your building manager folks can get excited about that. And so you really enlist those folks. So we're really looking at this as an opportunity to transform the classroom and really look at learning spaces differently. So it becomes a catalyst for exploring a lot of other things that are not necessarily related to games and education. And part of that is going to be reaching out to uh, our teachers in the district because I want them to have the kind of experiences you've had here. In fact, I wish I could convince these people to have this conference down in North Carolina. Um, but I don't know. Can we do one in North Carolina? <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see. I'll keep working on that. Um, but in the meantime, I'll be hosting the same kind of things um, out of this classroom. Um, for teachers in my district and teachers in surrounding areas. Um, and just, we, we've got to get the word out. And that was something I was talking on the way back to lunch with Chris. I said, um, one of the things that I honestly wish it was a requirement that all of you who were here had 
to now go back to your state tech conference or other conference, and you have to present on game based learning and what you're doing. Because it's one thing, it's almost like you're preaching to the choir a little bit here. Yeah, that's kind of strange. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so it, it's like I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are here, and you knew when you came that this is you know, games and education. But when I go back to my, my local um, tech conference and I present, it's still a very, a lot of it's still a very alien idea. It's very unusual, and we've got to change the conversation uh, with the game based learning. We also need, like I said, we need to rethink instructional spaces and things like that. So, I wanted to share with you some tips. 16, Chris has another one he'll share with you if you want to come down to the end, number 17. Um, <laughs> um, tips for bringing video games into your classroom. So, I want to give you some practical advice, things that have worked for me, um, things that have worked for other people, because as I, I have 12 or so um, already, and I walked by the um, uncommon suggestion of just some things that they wanted to see, and I'm like, I can have that as a tip. Maybe throw that in my presentation as well. So, number one, you really need to read what the experts are saying. Um, go on Amazon and buy these books, um, or, or go to your local bookstore or whatever um, and buy these books. What Game Time teaches about learning and literacy really outlines the pedagogical foundations for why games actually have a place in the classroom. Don't bother me, Mom. I'm learning is the kind of book that you would put in the principal's hand when he says, I don't know. Give him that book. Or a parent that says, My child's really playing a lot of Minecraft. Here, read this. And, and you'll have some context for understanding why that is and, and what we could do with this. Um, reality is broken. Um, if you haven't seen Jane McDonald's TED Talk, it's actually linked in the resources for this session. Um, but if you haven't seen her TED Talk on how games, to make the world a better place, take a look at it. It's actually a very motivational. Oh, right. <laughs> wow. I'll talk more about Jane McDonald. Yeah. Um, number two, talk to your learners. Um, if you guys have kids, talk to them in your classroom. Talk to them about the games that they're playing. If you haven't um, done you want to see something really exciting and watch kids like suddenly move engaged in you and what you're talking about in the discussion, ask them what video games they're playing. Can you guys name any of these? Okay, all right. I'm hearing some, that's good, okay. You, you, got some, you got some game cred, that's good. Um, if you don't have kids, just go out and find some, all right? <laughs> because it is a fascinating thing, it has been, since I've been doing this, it's been a fascinating experience for me to sit down with a kid, or beside a kid, and just watch, just to, to just listen, listen to the conversations that go on between kids as they're playing the same game, and even to ask them hard questions. Like, tell me about your strategy. Like, why did you do it this way instead of that way? And listen to the, the depth that they can bring to the explanation uh, when they're explaining these things. And, and if that doesn't cue you to the fact that something's going on here that we need to pay attention to that has to do with learning, then, then I don't know what will. It's a fascinating thing. So yeah, find some kids, play games with them, and, and um, don't be too free for it, but it, it's, it's worthwhile. And this was going to be tough for you, but um, and this is what I look like when I first picked up an Xbox controller. Um, it was, that's not me, but you know, it was like, uh, yeah, how many buttons? Because I, I was started out as a PC game all those buttons and the knobs and yeah, it was really tough. But I got better at it because I was determined I'm gonna play a game in this in this environment because I need to know about it. So pick up a new game and play it. Just go get a game and play it. Um, I highly recommend Minecraft, I highly recommend World of Warcraft and getting plugged into the cognitive dissonance skill where you're playing with a bunch of other teacher moves. Not all of them. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but you're playing with a lot of other people and, and you have that you have that shared experience. That's really important because people come up to me already at the conference and say, well, you know, how, how do you get started? How do I learn about these games? You know? And I think one of the things that scares teachers the most is not being the expert. Isn't that scary? You know, I, I used to have dreams about that when I taught biology, that for like the first five years of teaching, I would always have this dream the night before that um, class was starting, I'm there in front of them, I have nothing, nothing prepared. And, and I, I'm just like, it's funny, you are the, the professionals when it comes to 
language and learning. You know this stuff. You don't have to be the masters of the content. And when you bring an environment like this in that, that, that involve um, that involve these games, they're gonna know more about it than you. When you bring in things like iPods and iPads, they're gonna know more about it than you, or they're gonna be more comfortable with it than you are. They'll press the button to see what happens. Teachers will ask what happens before they press the button. Okay, right? And, and that's just the way it is. So don't be hesitant to go and just pick up a new game and play it. The second thing, the next thing you need to do is you need to put on your teacher lenses. And what I mean by that is not necessarily any classes that are quite that big, but you need to look at things through that lens. You need to look at the game critically as an educator and say, what's the pedagogy underlying this? What's somebody learning here? How does it work? And how does this game teach you how to play the game? And there's a lot of interesting lessons that we can apply from the video game to the classroom without even bringing video games into the classroom. Look at how video games teach. And why not just do your class that way? A lot of things like what Sean was talking about earlier, if you were in that presentation. And that's it. That's how video games work. Don't overlook commercial off-the-shelf games. Um, one day my dream will come true where I can say I can recommend an educational game. But right now I can't recommend most educational games because I suck. That was one. That was really good. That they're really bad. And, and, and it's not that they're, I mean, they're just skill and drill with pretty pictures and stuff like that. But kids know, and if I go and I tell the kids I'm going to play a video game, but then I put uh, an educational game in front of them, and read a rapid math class for them, they're not fooled by that. Because they go home and play Call of Duty. They go home and play um, free rounds and um, portal and things like that. They know what real games are like. So don't, don't fool them. Don't try to fool them that this is a game. Yeah, it's better than a worksheet, but we need to set our bar a little higher than that. So take a look at commercial off-the-shelf games because there's some really powerful things there. Now that's challenging because it doesn't come with a pre-designed curriculum in most cases. Um, but there's a lot of powerful um, learning there. Things like Civilization or SimCity and all that. Just play those games and, and see what's there and then maybe you can take it back to your classroom. There are teachers out there doing this. Start with your instructional goals in mind. Uh, think about what it is you want to teach your learners and then try to match that up to a game that can take you there. Um, you want to teach statistics, for example. There's a lot of interesting math in games like Madden or FIBA soccer, things like that. Go and look at the statistics. Have your students play the game. Look at the numbers. Have them crunch the numbers. Does it match up? Do, do, does the performance match up with the statistics that are reported in the game? How does that match up with the player's statistics in real life? How do they get these numbers? Think about all the potential learning that's there. Just for playing what students just think is just a fun sports game. There's a lot of potential. Um, don't ignore mobile games. A lot of you um, think, well, okay, I can't, I don't have access to a computer lab, or I don't, um, I don't have the money for a World of Warcraft program or something like that. And a lot, this is a hot trip right now in education. At least in my district, principals are buying up iPads and iPod touches like crazy. Mobile devices and tablet computers are the thing. Like, it's, it's all the rage. Well, guess what? You get a classroom set of iPads or iPod touches and you've got a perfect mobile gaming device in your classroom. And there are all kinds of cool games that you can do in this world. One example that I have a picture of there, we took students in a middle school classroom and we had them play the game The Sims, um, the, the iOS version of it, the iPod version of it. And we had them write a story out, then they captured, screen capture, um, different scenes. They set up their scenes in screen capture, and they brought them into script design, which is a comic book um, designing application, to tell their story. And then we published them online. It's a perfect example of how you can take games and make the standard kind of things that we do, for example, in an ELA classroom, and make them fun and relevant for the kids. <laughs> Number nine, please, this is my new pet peeve. <laughs> pet peeve, this is what I um, Don't incentivize the game play. Please don't do this. Don't say, if you do all your work, then you can play. Because all that does is reinforce that wall. Um, don't make the games a reward. Make the games part of the way you do business in the classroom. This is how we run. Um, yeah, we, we've got to stop doing this, and, and as much, and even in my own district, because they know how I'm like a video game guy, I still hear teachers talking in that way. Even after I've talked to them about this, they're like, well, um, I let them do all this, and then once they're done, they can play this. So in other words, the kids, what's that doing in their mind? They say, all this stuff is just like stuff I have to do. 
do to get to the thing that I wanted to. Yeah, it is, I've got to get through the school, right, to, to get to the stuff that I want to do, and we've got to stop doing that. So design your instruction in such a way that we, if you don't do that, this is the way we do business. Collaborate and share with other professionals. If you go out and, and begin to take steps into this world of game design, you are not alone in the products. Um, there's a bunch of people out there who have met some while you're here. Um, you can get one of my cards and you can email me and Skype me and tweet me and all that stuff, and I'll help you in any way that I can. Um, you're surrounded by experts, and they're on Twitter. Again, like all these cool people that are here at the conference um, this week. I mean, there, there's tons of people out there sharing resources and sharing ideas, and, um, and all you have to do is just go out and connect. And there, I've never met one that says, I don't want to share my stuff with you, right? Because when you're doing something crazy, you want to know that you're not alone. <laughs> so connect with people on Twitter. Number 11, make cookies for your IT staff that can be powerful allies. Um, one of the things, the hurdles that a lot of times I hear people or the barriers that I hear people often encounter is on my IT person will never let that happen. Train the cookies. There's a lot of IT guys really good on the cookies. Oh, that was really bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> it wasn't in the script, I promise. Um, but no, seriously, if you if you work with them and talk to them about um, about what the particular like how how this is going to impact student learning, how it's good for kids and what you're going to do, be very purposeful about what you're talking when you're talking to them about what you're going to do, um, and then show them if, if they need more you know assurance, then then again connect to me and I'll put them in touch with our network guy because my I, I happen to work with an awesome network administrator. And I can go to them and say, this is, I, I, I want to um, I have students using Xboxes to play certain games. So we need to be able to connect to Microsoft Xbox a lot. Um, currently, it's Washington Filter. These are my instructional goals. What can you do? He says, I can open that up for you. What well, can be available and open? The world is not going to end. All right? I assure you that, that, that the crazy Russian mafia hackers are not going to tunnel into your system through an open Xbox port and take you down. Because really, the schools, like, not really a hot topic, yeah. not a target. Get your administration on board. Again, give them some of those books. Hey, I was at a conference this week, pick this book up. I really want you to take a look at this. Um, you know, give them Prinsky's book, give them um, Jim G's book if they need more of the, the academic side of things. But talk to them, and, and really, the, the way you get this started, well, let me move back up, is you gotta, you gotta engage them in the dialogue. And you really, um, one of the things that you can do is reach out to those kids who are the um, untouchable, unlovable kids, your at-risk kids. Because principals, a lot of time, are looking for somebody who will do something special for those kids, and I assure you those kids are looking for somebody who's something special for them. And how awesome is it when, it, when you talk to things like, I talk about things like agency and ownership, when you take those very kids and say, you guys are part of a new group of kids who are going to be engaged in game-based learning. And yeah, you would be blown away by those kids. And that's a good way to get the principal on board. Um, that's how we started with World of Warcraft. We, we reached out to at risk students, students who were struggling with grades, behavior, and all those things. And the principal, once she saw, well, I mean, she was, she was green light about it. But once she came in and saw what was going on with those kids and how they were communicating and all the things that they were doing, she's like, this is amazing. We've got to take this to the next level. I want to bring her school together. So, you've got to get them on board, but you've got to show them those small wins. The next thing that I have to see people talk about is funding. Um, how do you get funding? Well, there's some interesting ways, and I'll share with you a couple ways that we funded projects in my district. Um, Kickstarter, if you haven't heard of Kickstarter, it's really interesting. It's sort of like uh, donors choose, but it's less um, inundated with education projects and people saying, like, I want to buy a class of workbooks or something. You know. There's some really innovative, creative things out there on Kickstarter. Um, and so we decided, hey, we'll give this a try. I mean, why not? Worst case scenario, we can learn how to write um, sort of like a grant proposal sort of thing, put it out there and, and interact with the world. And um, so one of my teachers, an art teacher at one of our middle schools, wrote a Kickstarter grant for um, doing a mirror project, our soccer project at her school, and it was fun. Um, and it was, it was crazy. Um, Exciting for her. Talk about something that, that gave her like like she is absolutely on fire. 
when it comes to the things that because she's had this success. And and I can get her to go to any conference now and present about game based learning and things like that. So now where there was just one of me, there's two and three and four of us in the district. And that's kind of how these things start. Um, so Kickstarter is a good example. The LucasProject.org. Yeah, good folks. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, um, Linda Brenneman, who, who kind of heads this up um, from Washington State, contacting me. When she saw, and I'll talk about this in a moment, um, things that I was putting out about trying to start this role of right for everybody. And she kind of she said, this is really interesting. Um, I'm supporting of, of, of reading and writing in the arts and things like that, and I'd like to know more about the project. Would you like me to propose it? Sure. You know, I don't know, this is just a cold email. Like, I had no idea who you are. So, oh, okay, whatever. Okay. I looked her up. Sure enough, she would, it was legit. So I'm like, all right, I'll write one up. Then I asked for the moon. And got the moon, and I was blown away. Um, and, and so in, in follow-up conversation, I'm like, so how did this happen? I'm like, really? Why don't you like, well, you know, we, we like what you're doing, we like game-based learning, and oh, also I have a level 70 by Paolo. She plays, so she gets it. And, and how incredible is that? So based off of that experience, her foundation spun off a, sort of a side project for the news project, and they fund classroom game-based learning projects, things like the soccer project. It's funded through the Leagues Project. Um, and um, they funded a Minecraft project in my district, things like that. So um, take a look at these folks, um, apply, you might get money. Um, of course, things like donors choose and of their other options out there as well. Like I said, starting the same place to fail. This is a great way to build acceptance. And, and for people who are kind of skeptical to come in and see uh, what's going on, and when they come and see the excitement of the kids and how engaged, they are, and, and you start, it's, it becomes a really a mirror for your classroom. You're like, why are they that excited about mitochondria? Or, or, or you know, the Gettysburg Address, or things like that. And, and so you realize that there's something going on here, let's, let's, let's explore it. And so you get your small successes, and then you ramp it up. This is another thing that teachers, and, and, and this goes right along with um, Sean's keynote the other day. Uh, teachers are very humble. And they don't like to brag about things. So don't brag about yourself. Brag about your kids. Market what's going on in your classroom. And I hate to borrow terms from the business world, but marketing, you've got to market yourself. You need to engage, contact the press, contact parents. Get parents to come out and see the awesome things that are going on in your classroom. Um, reach out to news stations and things like that. And, and if you want to get the green light, Get a few positive press stories out there when education is really starved for positive press, um, and it's, it's a good thing. Um, it really helps. And lastly, um, just remember about play. Um, and, and I'm glad that play keeps coming up in this because play is such a powerful thing. Remember how to play. Go play with your kids. Um, I think that's something that we have lost touch with um, a lot of times, and I think we need to go back and revisit that. Um, so I encourage you to do that. So lastly, just sort of a motivational thing, I, I want to say if you don't change things in your school, who's going to? Because if it's not you, who will? Really. But you guys have taken the first step you're here for the Games and Education Conference. Um, and, and you've been you've been equipped with the tools and the ideas and things like that from so many brilliant people. Um, so go back and do something. Do something awesome. Um, so that's I'm gonna leave you with that thought and then see if there's any questions we're gonna talk about. Soccer project or Wild School or Minecraft or anything like that, I'll be happy to talk to you. Questions? To Saga, um, you can, um, so, you can slide in. Okay, so um, my website is edurealms.com. Um, so, edurealms.com is sort of a place that. I'm a, like, I watch that show Borders and I can't stand that stuff, like it's being like creepy probably, but when, it, when I think about it, when it comes to the digital world, I'm a hoarder. And so when I find resources and things like that, I want them all in one place so I can go back and find them again and then share them with other people. So that's really what um, this site and, and why I use wikis for. Yes, that is exactly So edgingrounds.com is here. Um, the resources from today's session are all here and um, presentation and links and things like that. So you'll go link out to the wiki. 
um, just have to make wikis for everything because they're so easy, stupid easy to put things on wikis. And, um, and, and as we, it, this is very infancy stage of human software. So as we have successes and failures and things like that, things work, things don't work, um, that's where we're going to find that. But this is a perfect project for the media center, it's a perfect project for a classroom, for clubs, and things like that. And to have students do things critically with, um, with games. Other questions? Yes. That's a great question, and, and there's there's multiple layers to what you just asked. So a couple things. Um, one, invite them into the classroom. Um, my students and the projects that I'm involved with um, expect visitors. Um, and, and that really, that's another ownership piece there too. When people are coming in to see what they're doing, they own it a lot more. Um, their parent, you need to invite parents in anytime. Parents can come in and see what we're doing. Everything that we've done, whether it be Minecraft or World of Warcraft or the Soccer Project, is completely voluntary, collective type thing that's not required. So um, we, we do, for all of these projects, there's like a parental permission form that we send home and we explain to parents what it's about, we market it to the parents. Like, look, we think it's a good idea. We think your kid's gonna really love this. Um, and, and eventually, you begin to build that support. The parents talk to each other, and, and then they start demanding it. They talk to other parents from other schools, and they start spreading, like, they talk to the principal, why don't we have that at our school? Um, the parental side of this has been nothing but positive. I wasn't sure, starting with World of Warcraft, like, how are they gonna respond, uh, parents, and, and they've been nothing but positive. We had one come in and sit down, and, and to step aside our child one class period and just watch him play, which is exactly what I want to see parents do. Um, so that, there's that. When it comes to the violence thing, um, that's always a hot topic. Um, it's more a hot topic because the media inflames it and it's like, oh, violence. And there's no science <laughs> to, to, to connect violence um, and, and, and violent behavior um, and, and having any like major long, you know, impact or anything like that on kids. Um, in fact, it's probably the opposite. Um, so I would recommend that you go and take a look at um, Henry Jenkins' article online about eight myths about video games debunked, and he addresses that and other issues as well. That's linked in the notes here, um, so you can go and check that out. And, and you know, it, it, it's interesting that we talk a lot about violence, yet um, we, we, we assemble in the stands every Friday night at our high schools and cheer as our kids beat each other up. And I just like, isn't that weird? Um, is something wrong here? Or, and we think things like Romeo and Juliet are like examples of like, have you ever, yeah, what did you envision when, you know, Romeo stabbed that dude, you know, like, how, what did that look like to you in your mind? So, violence is just part of the human condition. Um, to ignore it doesn't do it in service. But if we address it and we tackle it head on and we talk about it in an open way, I think that's a positive thing. Um, but yeah, it's not, it, it's surprisingly the brutal side and even the press That's been exciting, I think. Hopefully that'll be good. Are we done? I see you. They, they are, and, and that's awesome. Um, we've had the same kind of experience in our district. Um, a superintendent, our assistant superintendent, was contacted by a parent of a child who's in our Ronald School Project. And, and she contacted the superintendent, and this is the way the superintendent, or assistant superintendent, really relayed this to me. And I think she was messing with me a little bit. She said, There have been some concerns about your Wild School Project. I was like, Oh no, it's over. I'm not going to have to do the work now. And, um, and she said, um, A parent contacted, and she's really about her child who's, who's in the world of Warcraft in school. She said, because he's going to the high school next year. We don't have this. What's he going to do? Because it has kept him, it is, he is a 
his communication skills have improved. Um, he has, um, his behavior has completely changed. Um, and, and it's been something I will say that he actually comes to school now. What are they going to do when he goes to high school? They don't have that. And, and at the same time, I wanted to cheer. I also wanted to cry because, yeah, it, my high schools are my toughest area to break into. Um, and so, yeah, positive, positive things. Um, so if you need a card or, or what, I've got a few brochures that I brought with about some of the stuff that we're doing. Feel free to come down here and get one. And, and this is a perfect segue into um, anything.